the criticism that's directed at patriarchal structures, let's say, is predicated on the idea that they're fundamentally exploitative mm -hmm. and that the relationship between people is one of power. And the implication of that, especially if it's arbitrary power, the implication is that anybody who occupies anything but the lowest tiers in a given organization is in consequence an oppressor. And, 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 but that Mises insisted that people banded together for purposes of cooperation and multiplication of effort. And that's a completely different view. So can you, can you provide some justification for that? Sure, so the starkest contrast though with, with Mises responding to that Marxist worldview is he thought that no ideas are the, the primary motivation that you know human action starts always with a thought you know people have a, a goal and they use their reason to you know choose a means to try to attain it they might fail but that's what purposes behavior is. right that's what he meant by human so we're action. rational sovereign actors right and, and we're and, trying to chart our own course right and so for him to explain for example you know why is it that it went from feudalism to the, the industrial capitalist age. Mises would say it's because ideas of individual sovereignty and you know in, people have rights and you know, for various historical reasons in Western Europe that emerged, whether it was because of Christianity or just the squabbling in the terrain. But the idea that you know the, the king can't come into your house. You're, you're the castle. You know your house is your castle. Like notions like that, Mises argued, came out of Western Europe earlier than other places and that's why they you know took over the world basically like that that was the reason and so then scientifically or empirically what why you know why did why was that idea so potent or powerful it's because of what you're saying that Mises thought it just so happens to be the case that human labor when you work cooperatively gets magnified many fold that if we special instead of everyone growing their own food making their own clothes and everything being their own okay doctor, so there's an attractive mm -hmm. there's an attractive quasi-religious notion as well mm -hmm. okay so here's what we do i'll tell you a little story about this i went and stayed at an airbnb out on the coast of british columbia one year and it was this nice little cabin perched on this on the shore of this idyllic island um, it was a kind of a log cabin, quite primitive, but very, very beautiful, in a beautiful locale. And the people who owned the place were from Europe, and they were back to the land types. So, you know, ni the 1990s equivalent of hippies, and they believed that everyone would be better off if they were self-sufficient and, and that they would be more psychologically healthy if they returned to the land. And so they bought this place. Well. They were trying to be self-sufficient and grow their own chickens and raise their own chickens. You don't really grow them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to raise their own chickens and plant their own vegetables and, and so forth. And what they soon discovered was that that was unbelievably difficult life. That they were struggling every second to stay afloat financially. And that being self-sufficient, especially on an island, which is a place that poses its own complications, especially in a harsh climate, they were completely trapped and they couldn't sell their property for anything near the market value, the value that they had purchased it for. And so their move back to the land was a complete bloody catastrophe. And so, well, I want to tell that story because we have these romantic notions, you know, that we should all be self-sufficient and, and, and that everyone would be better off individually, in their family, in their town, in their estates, if we were self-sufficient. But there's a different idea, which is that we're better off trading with someone, generally speaking, even if we're better at everything we do than they are at anything they do. And so that's a really crucial point. And so maybe I could get you to elaborate on that. Like, we're rational people. We don't band together to tyrannize each other. We band together to maximize our productivity. And we do that to stave off the catastrophes of nature, let's say, so that we have enough to eat and enough to drink and we don't die from some bloody miserable disease. That's where the tyranny is in our subjection to our vulnerability. We band together to maximize our productivity. Why does that work? Why is that justifiable in terms of assessing the nature of our social institutions? Okay, sure. And, and again, just to drive home for Mises, how critical this was. For him, that was the basis of civilization. That's why we, we need to have 
property rights. We need to have you know rules of social order. You can't go around killing people. He would ultimately say because we, civilization, you know, our standard of living rests on the fact that we all specialize in what we do best, produce way more of our thing than we need personally, and trade it with others. And so, if every you know, if certain people specialize in our farmers and they grow way more food than they need and sell the rest to others. And some people just make a bunch of sweaters, way more than their family needs to wear and they sell it. Some people just make a bunch of cars, way more than they're gonna drive and they sell it. We all end up with more food, sweaters, yeah, and that's cars. Because once you build one car, building the second one is a lot easier. R right, It's yes. a lot easier, right. right. So, so, so yeah, there's a few reasons to try to understand why is it that specialization magnifies the productivity of yeah well effort. let's walk through yeah. that okay so, so there's a proposition yeah. specialization maximizes mm -hmm. productivity uh, and then trade is of benefit to all sure. okay so let's okay. justify that yeah. from so, first okay. principles so I'll, I'll give you some obvious reasons so one is people have different abilities and and so you know some people are just like a big burly guy is going to be better as a coal miner than some dainty woman Right, and, and so things like that are obvious, okay. Certain regions around the world just are more hospitable, right? You're gonna grow more oranges in Florida than you are in Alaska. Doesn't, you know, that's just so clearly the people in Florida should specialize in growing oranges right. and people in Alaska So we should. can capitalize on the unequal distribution mm -hmm. of productive resources right. by trading. Right. Right, the instead of trying to eradicate the inequality, we can capitalize mm -hmm. on right. the fact that it exists, which is, in a sense, is something that eradicates it. And, you know, uh, what would you say, practically speaking. And that's important yeah. to note too, because, you know, we have this idea, and I think it's deeper rooted in our moral intuitions, that everybody should be equal. It's like, well, wait a second, we trade on our inequality. So that's kind of interesting. You're better at something than I am at something, let's say, and that's an inequality. And, and you might even say, well, you became unjustly better at that than I did you know, for historical reasons, but the fact of the matter is that inequality exists, so let's try to address it. Well, one way of addressing it would be for me to get as good as you are at that thing, but the other way would be for me to do what I'm good at, and for you to do what you're good at, and for us to trade. Mm -hmm. And then if we have money, well, we can transform the value of our labor into something that's universal, and that is an equalizing force in and of itself. Right, yeah, that, that's all certainly true. Um, just another quick one though is even if people had similar aptitudes up front like two, two people who are identical in all respects if one of them went into studying brain surgery and one of them went into studying chemistry 30 years later when you check in on them the one person's going to be way better at doing brain surgery than the other person's going to be way better at you know, identifying new chemical compounds. Right, so because we have finite resources, each of us, because we have finite time, that means that we can't be as good as everyone can be at everything, right. ever. Mm -hmm. And so we end up specializing in something so that we have a comparative advantage, but that's, it's not, see, the language here, and you said Mises is very careful with his language, mm -hmm. so let's be very careful with our language. If I study for 30 years, it isn't exactly that I have a comparative advantage over you. It's that I comparatively have something to offer you, right? Because advantage implies that I've taken something from you in some sense, or now that I can hold something over you, you know, because you say take an advantage of someone. Mm -hmm. But it isn't that. It's now that I'm bringing something to the table that you actually desire. And so that's not an advantage I have. It's something that I have to offer. That's, and if I have any sense, I've picked something that I have to offer that I know other people want. And so there's a right. kind of altruism that's built into that specialization.